the rarest of books, sold to Dr. R, memories of a voyaging bibliophile, A.S.W. Rosenbach. The gas lamps in Stan Pfeffer Henkels' auction rooms in Philadelphia were being extinguished. An exciting sale of books had just ended, and I was left a rather bitter young man. The purchaser of the one book I had so eagerly hoped to secure was a thin, wiry man with a face of rare charm. He was not an auction habitué, at least not at Henkels's, or I should have recognised him. One gets used to the same old faces in an auction room. Earlier that evening I had noticed him two rows ahead of me, a distinguished-looking person. But once the auctioneer's hammer had struck, giving him the final decision on his bid, I changed my opinion, and he now appeared highly distasteful to me. As I went to open the street door I passed him. He stood showing the book to a group of other buyers. I would have died rather than ask his permission to look at that ancient missile, which I felt he had deliberately taken from me. And what a copy! As perfect as the day it came from the scriptorium in Touraine nearly four hundred years ago. More important still, it had belonged at one time to the exquisite and altogether enchanting Gabrielle Destre. She may have treated her lovers negligently, but to her books she gave the gentlest care. If the truth were known, she had a more tender regard for her books than for Henry IV. Perhaps she abandoned him to find change and relaxation in looking at the pictures in this volume. I was nineteen. The ephemeral love affairs of great court beauties catch the imagination at that age as they never do in later years. You see, I had been saving every penny I could lay my hands on to buy this book. I had read about it in the sale catalogue. It is not exactly clear to me today why I so desperately wanted to own this particular missile. Perhaps it was one of those waxing obsessions which seize book lovers at all seasons of the year. I remember it was a warm, languorous spring. The night air was sweet. As I walked along, I asked myself many questions. What good had come of my hoarding every cent to purchase it? Wasn't it unfair of wealthy men who attend auctions never to give the poor student a chance? I had gone to that sale with fifty-seven dollars in my pocket. It was an enormous sum for me to invest in one book, and I really doubted that anyone would want this particular volume badly enough to pay more than fifty dollars for it. Imagine my surprise when this stranger overbid me by three dollars. Depressed, I wandered for some time along the ill-lighted street before I was aware of quick steps behind me. It was my successful competitor, and from another direction I saw a horse and cab drive toward me. A dim streetlight revealed the blurred outlines of a rickety, worn-out nag whose driver slouched above on the box. It was Weehikel. Now, Weehikel was a coachman of local renown. His thin, emaciated, donk-exotic figure had always attracted my attention. Weehikel knew more individuals of prominence in Philadelphia than did the mayor himself. Further, Weehikel had vision. To be carried home in the early hours by Weehikel boded good. In this way, he had sponsored the early careers of more youths who later became distinguished citizens than any Harvard professor. This night, he drove to the curb and recognized me. At the same time, the footsteps in the darkness quickened and an anxious voice shouted, Cabby! Now I wanted to go home with Weehikel myself. With a rude bound, I reached the cab door before the person behind me. Which way are you going? he asked me as he came close to the cab. His voice was clear and friendly, nor was the dark too thick to hide the kindliness of his expression. With that forced reciprocal politeness, which often overtakes one in the heat of anger or disappointment, I battled with a desire to grab the book and run off into the darkness. I can take you anywhere you care to go, I answered. He heard the vindictive note in my voice as I meant him to. He looked at me uneasily. Perhaps he feared I had been drinking. I feel like having a bite, he began. I'd like to go to McGowan's. Perhaps you will join me. Without waiting for a reply, he leaned forward and called out our destination to Weehikel. Those were the days when McGowan's was an all-night meeting place where convivial souls gathered to eat, drink, and to be quietly merry. It was famous for its terrapin. In fact, it was at that time one of the great restaurants of America. Situated at the corner of 15th and Sansom Streets, it had an entrance on either side. 
When we arrived, I told Wee Heichel to wait. After ordering supper, my host picked up the Gabriel Destre volume and exhibited it in a most tantalizing manner. You paid a very high price for that little missile, I ventured. He looked up, surprised. How do you know? I was there, at the auction. At that moment, the waiter brought two long-stemmed glasses filled with a golden-brown liquid. It was bitter and warming. I was the underbidder, I said. You bid me up? The waiter replaced our glasses with others. We drank silently. So you wanted this book? Well, well, you love books. I nodded. His face seemed to soften. And what would you have given for it? He handed the volume across the table to me, and my fingers trembled. All that I have in the world, I said dramatically. Fifty-seven dollars. The waiter came forward with our supper. It was a beautiful repast worthy of the skill of Dennis McGowan himself. As we ate, I listened to my new friend through an ever-thickening haze. He told me of his interest in books and manuscripts. He was not a collector exactly, he explained, but a man who bought intermittently as the desire came upon him. And now, said he, since you wanted this book so badly, will you accept it as a proof of our newly made friendship? He leaned across the table, and I grasped his hand. He insisted upon my accepting the volume as a gift. Then we talked of books and bookmen until far into the night. We walked home in the early morning air. The next day at noon, as I crossed the campus of the University of Pennsylvania, I was aware of a familiar figure who waved and attracted great attention with a coach whip. It was Weeheichel. Say, young Rosenbach, he hollowed, what do you mean keeping me waiting all night on Sansom Street? He came toward me on a run, accusingly. Sneaking out on 15th Street, you and your friend. I want my money. I waited outside all night long. Twenty-five dollars, night rates. To quiet his shouting, I motioned him to follow me to my room. I had forgotten him completely. Had the preceding night been a dream or a nightmare? Surely it was neither, for there on my bookshelf was the missile in its old gilt binding, the book which had been forced so generously upon me. I paid Wee Heichel gladly and figured his services cheap at the price. As to the gentleman who presented me with the volume, it was Joseph M. Fox. He later became my partner in the book business. The auction business is an old, old game. Herodotus, somewhere in his writings, describes the auctions which took place once a year in all Babylonian villages. In those days, before the advent of the bachelor girl, despairing parents hopefully offered their surplus maidens in the auction mart, where they disposed of them in marriage to the highest bidders. Then there were the auctions which followed military victories. The Romans solved the problem of dividing captives and other spoils of war in this popular manner, but the first book auctions, as far as records show, began in the latter part of the 17th century in Holland. The enterprising Dutchman, who originated the idea of selling literary works by competitive bid, whether he was a book lover or interested only in cold commercial hope of gain, should have his memory appreciatively marked by periods of celebration down the years. Can't you imagine every true book lover bowing to the name of this fellow who brought a new and sharp-edged enjoyment into the book game? Of all the branches of the sport connected with book collecting, that of attending book auctions is the greatest, the most stirring. I presume some patient mathematician knows the number of facets of the Koh i Noor diamond, but no one will ever be able to count the emotional reflections which take place during a book auction in the hearts and minds of men and women who are enamoured of books. The book auction is an adventure. Other adventures may lose their glamour if you repeat them, but each experience at a sale of books brings a delightful thrill never to be duplicated. Other experiences in your life may have been exciting, and you will always shrink from repeating them, in the fear, perhaps, that they may lose some one quality. But the book auction, which includes the sale of literary manuscripts and letters, continues to offer those very elements which first fascinated you. Don't be surprised when you find yourself one of the habitual adventurers. Unsympathetic, misunderstanding friends may accuse you of being a book auction fiend, but you will listen indulgently and let it go at that.
Most of the great books of the world have found their way to the auction room at one time or another. Bibliophiles of renown have sat restlessly out front, bidding against one another. It is these, rare books and the buyers of them, who have given to the auction its illustrious background. Nearly every collector enters the auction field to enjoy its seductive pleasures some time during the period of his fever. When you first go to an auction, you firmly believe that prices are at their highest. The complaint of high prices is as old as the auction game itself. The morning after every sale, you read the same old story in your newspaper of the crazy, mad and exorbitant prices which were paid. Present prices always seem high. If you keep a record of them, you will find, in ten years' time, that these prices are extremely low. As a matter of fact, prices will never be lower than they are today. Certain items may fluctuate, but in general the great classics of all literature can be revalued upward every ten years. Very often, you may have the feeling that you paid too much for some book. In other words, you were stung, and it may be so. But the beauty of it all is that an auction holds fair play for all sides. Even the experienced buyer is liable to get stung. You are in good company. And joy of joys, the auctioneer, your arch enemy, sometimes gets charmingly stung himself. For who can say when some bargain will drop unexpectedly into the collector's maw? I remember a case in point. It was during the third part of the wholesale in April 1912. In the catalogue, a celebrated autograph play by Lope de Vega was listed. Entitled Carlos V, it had been written in Toledo and was dated November 20th, 1604. Now, manuscript plays by this famous Spanish writer are extremely desirable. Although the greatest book dealers and collectors of England, France, Italy and Germany were present that night, they either slighted or forgot its value. I purchased it on my first bid, one twenty-five dollars. A collector in Philadelphia had given me a bid of seven thousand five hundred dollars on it. He was even then sitting at his telephone impatiently waiting to hear if I had secured it for him. The above story is at the expense of a New York house. My next will be on a British concern, in order to balance honours. At the sale of the Britwell Court Library in London in 1923, I noticed a little book lying sandwiched between Pace's Fortune's Lottery or how a ship of Bristol called the Angel Gabriel fought against the Spanish and Palingenius's The Zodiaca of Life. It was Philip Payne's Daily Meditations, or Quotidian Preparations for and Consideration of Death and Eternity, printed at Cambridge by Marmaduke Johnson in 1668. As it was passed around the room, all my bookman friends looked at it and shook their heads. A value, they thought, comparatively slight, only a dull theological work. As I reread the lengthy title, something back in my brain made me concentrate more carefully upon it. Somewhere those printed words struck a vaguely familiar chord in my memory. All during the sale, I kept turning forward to that page in my catalogue where it was listed. Suddenly, I knew. Marmaduke Johnson, it was who printed in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the first holy scriptures issued for the North American Indians, the Eliot Indian Bible. The little book was put up for sale, and I asked leave to examine it again for a moment before bidding. I knew at once it was printed in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and not England. This made it tremendously rare, because it was the only known copy, hitherto unrecognised, of the first volume of verse printed in North America. Those present took it for granted from the catalogue description that the little work was printed in Cambridge, England, and as such was certainly worth less than the price at which it was soon knocked down to me, £51. After the sale, several people, including a great Americana expert and the auctioneer, met me and rather twitted me for paying $250 for a stupid old religious tract worth, but a few shillings. They were amazed that I had shown such a lapse of judgment. When I informed them what the book really was, the auctioneer sadly asked, Doctor, what would you really have given for it? When I said £8,000 or £9,000, between $40,000 and $50,000, he was not any too happy. During the following year, when the little tract by Baxter in the Indian dialect appeared for sale, they catalogued it Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
Thus listed, it sold for $34,000, as I have mentioned before. You see, we are always reading of record prices, and it is very rare to hear of the valuable things that slip through unobserved. It is these latter that give book auctions their zest, and the auction houses, if they only knew it, benefit also by the chance bargain, for it is this very thing that attracts the public. On the other hand, the most experienced buyer never knows when he will have to pay a really high price. It is the average, after all, that counts. Yet here is a phenomenon which has always seemed peculiar to me. When times are bad and prices in Wall Street are tumbling, when steel sells far below its worth and the oils go begging, rare volumes continue to command an ever-increasing price. In 1907, the year of the panic, books sold for record sums at auctions, while so-called standard securities dipped sharply in a helpless market. Two years later, when national finances were again wobbly, when the bears were having a picnic with the lambs, old books went for higher prices than ever before. In the Henry W. Poor sale, held in New York in this same year, Record prices were established, despite the prediction of the wiseacres, who said that prices must go down. It is for this reason that some of the most discerning men in Wall Street purchase rare books as an investment. I know many a captain of industry who quietly hides away in the secrecy of his strong box rare little volumes such as Shakespeare quartos, small pamphlets by Shelley, and even first editions of Joseph Conrad. These rich men realize and rightly too, that such treasures will always sell at a premium, even though the market is tumbling and Wall Street is in a panic. Owners of precious books always find they do not have to wait for the chance buyer. Their volumes can be sent to the auction mart at any time, where they will realize, as a rule, their full value. America has had two really great auctioneers, Stan V. Henkels, of beloved memory, and the late Thomas E. Kirby. The latter, in many respects, exerted the greatest influence of any person in the auction world of this country. He was the founder of the American Art Association, and his opinions on objects of art were accepted as gospel by the most meticulous collectors, including the late P. A. B. Widener, William A. Clark, and Henry C. Frick. He was really brilliant on the block, and his remarks were frequently the wittiest imaginable. I remember as a youth going to his auctions and being fascinated by his repartee and the rapidity with which he sold. Stan V. Henkels was the only auctioneer who catalogued every work himself and cried his own sales too. His humour was irresistible, and the audience would often break out in guffaws of laughter at his many bright sallies. Thomas E. Kirby on the Rostrum in 1902, I attended a sale at Henkels's where the price of a certain volume caused the book world to hum for months afterward. I was late and entered the room as the bidding began on a little book which was placed in full view of the audience. I asked one of the employees for its number in the catalogue and found that it was The Dying Words of Okanakan, an Indian king, and was published in London in 1682. It did not seem to be a volume of much importance. I was acquainted somewhat with its history. The highest price it had ever brought was $52.50 at the Barlow sale in 1890. I leaned forward to whisper to a friend in the row ahead of me, and he said $200 would be an enormous price for it. Suddenly, the air seemed charged with electricity, and I looked about to see who was bidding. On one side of the room sat a man I knew, A.J. Bowden, who represented George H. Richmond and Company of New York. On the other, I saw Mr. Robert Dodd, of Dodd, Mead and Company. Both were experienced auction bidders, with the set expression of the mouth and the feverish, alert look. I did not know at the time that both had received instructions to buy this particular work at any price. Each had that most dangerous weapon of the auction game, the unlimited bid. From $60 the price rapidly jumped. Stan V. Henkels, colourful, suave, Provocative, naive, and humorous, kept egging them on. Up and up the price went, until it reached the dollar nine hundred mark. Then a murmur of consternation swept the room, followed by a hush. 
Robert Dodd broke the silence with a dollar one hundred raise. Bowden followed with another dollar one hundred, and Dodd added dollar one hundred more. When Bowden finally shouted, Thirteen hundred dollars, Dodd smiled. Fourteen hundred, he said sweetly. Just at this moment, poor old Bowden exhibited his first sign of weakness. He stopped bidding in hundreds and raised the bid twenty-five. Dodd saw his chance and brought up his battalion with a crash. Little Ocanican was wrested from Bowden at the freak price of dollar one thousand four hundred fifty. When Richmond read in the paper next morning the price at which he had so nearly bought Ocanican, he fell out of bed. Speaking of freak prices, think of my surprise when I went to an auction one day last year and saw with amused amazement a little volume of book mysteries I once wrote. I felt self-conscious, uncomfortable and pleased, all rolled into one, when the bids on the unpublishable memoirs jumped up and it finally sold for $16. The joke is that this volume is still obtainable at its published price of $2.50. The enormous and ever-increasing attendance at auction sales in the established city auction rooms is caused by the hope that sometime a real bargain will come your way. This is the lure, the real bait. It has an appeal all its own. But for the young enthusiast, it is often a costly and dangerous game. It is wiser to begin your bidding under the guidance of an experienced agent. There are several collectors and owners of great private libraries in this country whose names are entirely unknown in the auction room. They may enter the sales room incognito to enjoy watching their agent at battle with others, but they are careful not to run any risks themselves through careless, inexperienced bidding. One of the greatest book collectors in the world, Mr. Henry E. Huntington, never bid. In all the years during which he was buying, he never entered the lists to joust for himself. In the forty years I have been bidding, I have found a new thrill in every sale, from my earliest years at Henkels's auctions to the most recent sales in London, Paris, and New York. I have repeatedly known a fine exhilaration. I sniff the air like an old war horse at the smell of powder. How often have I felt my pulses race, my temperature rise with the rising bids? But as I grow older, I find I have to fight that deadliest of maladies, conservatism. This is one thing in the world that the collector should pray to be delivered from. Of course, it is awfully difficult to pay $500 today for a book that in your youth you could have picked up for only 20 or to buy a book for $1,000 which two years ago passed through your fingers for one-third as much. The late George D. Smith a spectacular figure in the auction mart for more than twenty years, was the only man I ever knew entirely immune from conservatism. I can remember him at the Ho sale in 1911-12. to 12. There he was constantly bidding against the sharpest and most astute members of both the European and the American book trade. How cool and collected he was in the very midst of battle. The comments of his competitors remained unnoticed by him when he paid what were then considered extravagant prices for books and manuscripts, and his judgment was right. Today, these same items can't be bought for two or three times the sums he paid. When he purchased, toward the end of the sale, a Gutenberg Bible for $50,000, everyone said he had gone quite mad. They did not realize that the same remarks were made 65 years earlier, when, in 1847, James Lennox had given £500, about $2,500, for it. This copy is now in the New York Public Library. In my opinion, the Gutenberg Bible was then worth every dollar of the $50,000 which GDS paid for it. Ten years from now, it will be cheap at $250,000. There have been many notable auctions during the past 20 years, but I shall never forget my first one in England in 1907. A dear friend of mine, and a most intelligent collector of exquisite taste, Mr. William C. Van Antwerp of San Francisco, had gathered together a small but delectable library, which he decided to sell at Sotheby's in March of that year. I crossed on the Oceanic with Alfred Quaritch, who occupied a commanding position in the book world. I was but one of the small fry, out of college only a few years, Quaritch and I had been drawn to each other by the magnet of books. 
On the way over, we talked of the sale, and I dwelt with especial emphasis on the fine first folio of Shakespeare in Van's collection. In a way, I was sounding out Quaritch, for I knew instinctively that it would be useless to bid against this giant of the auction room if he wanted the folio himself. I grew very nervous as we sat in the smoking room one evening when we were about five days out. I decided I had hemmed and hawed long enough. Finally, I worked up courage to ask him to execute a bid for me on the folio. He seemed surprised and did not answer for some moments. Then he asked me, How much do you intend to bid? I warn you, if it's too low, I'll buy it myself. I answered weakly, Five thousand pounds. He opened his eyes wide. That is a bid, he said, and I'll get it for you. Then came the day of the auction in London. I remember sitting next to Quaritch, witnessing the battle of wits and bids at Sotheby's. I was shaking like the proverbial aspen leaf to a degree that I have never done since. The bidding on the folio opened at pound 500. After what seemed an interminable length of time, it was knocked down to Quaritch for pound 3,600. I was so completely overcome with joy that I had to walk around the block for air and refreshment to buck me up. This was a handsome copy bound in Morocco by Bedford, a celebrated craftsman of the 70s S. I recall, too, Harry Elkins Widener's pleasure when this folio passed finally into his possession. I think of all the books of his fine collection, he valued this one the most. Years later, when we paid pound 8,600, a little under $43,000, at the Baroness Burdett Coutts's sale, the record price for a Shakespeare folio, I received my brother Philip's cable, advising me of our luck, without a tremor. Fifteen years had rolled by. Much water had run under the bridge. Poor Quaritch, my dearest friend in the book business, had passed away, only forty-two years old when he died. His death was a great loss to the world of rare books. The price of a first folio indicates the trend of values in the English market, just as the Boucher Moliere, 1734, shows the state of the French market, while the Dante, printed in Foligno, 1472, tells the tale of the Italian market. These books are always rising in value, and it is the rapidity of their change in price that shows which way the wind is blowing. Today, when the condition of a book is everything and collectors pay more attention to it than to anything else, fine first folios of Shakespeare are judged by these three points. First, the copy must have its full number of leaves, each page perfect, without facsimile. Second, the binding. It is, of course, more desirable in the original binding, or next, rebound in the 18th century, or lastly, in a good modern binding. In years to come, the original binding will be the chief of all desiderata. Third, the folio must be of adequate size, about 13 by 8 and a quarter inches. A quarter of an inch one way or another can spell tragedy to the fanatical collector. If you are lucky enough to find a first folio having all three of these qualities, the gods are with you. I have been fortunate to procure such an one, the celebrated copy from Sir George Holford's library. It is perfect in every detail. It is exceptional in having the blank leaves, known in no other copy. Its original old calf binding is without a single blemish. This is the finest first folio known to exist. It is the cornerstone of a collection of Shakespeare's works which I have been gathering for many years. I remember the excitement when we exhibited in our Philadelphia show window the four folios, each in its original binding, the poems, in a similar binding, and 41 of the early quarto plays. The passionate interest shown by the man in the street indicated his never-flagging enthusiasm for anything pertaining to the greatest writer the world has known. In 1905, Mr. Bernard Buchanan McGeorge of Glasgow sold four Shakespeare folios in their original binding to Marsden J. Perry of Providence, Rhode Island. He doubtless believed he was using his cunning Scotch wisdom to a high degree when he steadfastly held out for £10,000. At this price, he figured he was doing himself a neat turn because he had paid only £1,700 for them six years before. 
But if he had been a bit cannier, a little more patient, he would have received two or three times the sum Mr. Perry paid him. When the balance of the Majorge Library was offered for sale at Sotheby's in July 1924, all the bibliophiles in Bookdom would have torn one another to bits to get the Shakespeare folios at the old price. But I was lucky enough to procure them when I purchased en bloc the Perry Library, and today they are in the library of Mr. Joseph Widener at Linwood Hall near Philadelphia. Thank goodness they are at least near home, where I can look at them to my heart's content. The history of the Shakespeare folios is an interesting one. Shakespeare's genius was so overwhelming that even the least of the nitwits of his day appreciated him. His greatest contemporaries were the most eager to preserve his works. Immediately after his death in 1616 steps were taken to issue a complete edition of his plays. His manuscripts were probably collected, but alas, not saved, and scholars of the time, many of whom had known him well, laboured to procure a perfect text. Three years passed. Then, in 1619, the English public was surprised to see issued a single volume containing nine plays. No one knows how many copies composed this edition, but it is a strange circumstance that but one copy is in existence today. I once owned it, but it finally passed to Mr. H. C. Folger of New York, who added it to his remarkable collection of Shakespeareana. This one surviving copy is in its original binding. It has an index, too, in the quaint old handwriting of its first owner, Edward Gwynne, who proudly stamped his name in gilt on the outside cover. Even though I should not care to be dubbed a prophet in my own country, I do not hesitate to say that this book would bring at least $200,000 if it were sold on the block today. This 1619 volume was but a makeshift, playing for its sale upon the magic name of Shakespeare. John Hemmings and Henry Condell, both true and tried friends of the great bard and fellow actors mentioned in his will, undertook to give the world a complete and correct edition of his plays. William Jaggard and his son Isaac were responsible for the printing, a laborious task when you consider that the volume consisted of 1,000 double-column pages. Thus, the great first folio was finally issued in 1623 in a plain calf binding. It contained a portrait of William Shakespeare with a leaf of verses on the opposite page by his famous contemporary, Ben Jonson. These are among the finest lines ever written concerning Shakespeare, and perhaps the greatest from Jonson's pen. The original price of the first folio was five dollars a copy, one pound in 1623, and yet in the years between 1700 and 1750 it had only advanced to ten which reminds me of a good story. In 1790, the copy belonging to John Watson Reed was offered for sale. That astute collector, the Duke of Roxburgh, wanted it and commissioned an agent to buy it for him. The bidding started at five pounds and rose to the enormous sum of 20 guineas. Everyone was astounded. The Duke's agent grew faint-hearted and passed a slip of paper to him, suggesting that his grace retire from the contest. The Duke replied with these memorable and appropriate words, Lay on, Macduff, and damned be him that first cries, Hold enough! The folio finally fell to the Duke for thirty-five pounds. How often, when I feel myself weakening at a sale, do I think of the old Duke's quotation from Macbeth? It should be the motto of every auction bidder. The Duke of Roxburgh's library was sold at Sotheby's in 1812, and it included the first folio. It brought an advance of almost 300%, being purchased by the Duke of Devonshire for pound 100. It can be seen now in the Henry E. Huntington Library. The sale of this collection, more than 115 years ago, provided a sensation which is still talked about and was not equalled until the auction of the Gutenberg Bible a year ago last February. As Thomas Frognall Dibdin said, it reverberated around the world. The Valdafa Boccaccio was the highlight in the Roxburgh sale. This notorious volume was the only perfect copy of the first edition of the Decameron. I have always thought that his flowery description of the bidding which took place in that grand era of bibliomania as he was so pleased to term it, 
applies exactly to the tactics used in the modern auction room. Dibdin wrote as follows. The room was crowded to excess, and a sudden darkness which came across gave rather an additional interest to the scene. At length, the moment of sale arrived. Mr. Evans prefaced the putting up of the article by an appropriate oration, in which he expatiated upon its excessive rarity, and concluded by informing the company of the regret, and even anguish of heart, expressed by Mr. Van Praet, that such a treasure was not at that time to be found in the imperial collection at Paris. However, it should seem Bonaparte's agent was present. Silence followed the address of Mr. Evans. On his right hand, leaning against the wall, stood Earl Spencer. A little lower down, and standing at right angles with his lordship, appeared the Marquis of Blandford. The Duke, I believe, was not then present, but my Lord Althorpe stood a little backward to the right of his father, Earl Spencer. Such was the ground taken up by the adverse hosts. The honour of firing the first shot was due to a gentleman of Shropshire, unused to this species of warfare, and who seemed to recoil from the reverberation of the report himself had made. One hundred guineas, he exclaimed. Again a pause ensued, but anon the biddings rose rapidly to five hundred guineas. Hitherto, however, it was evident that the firing was but masked and desultory. At length, all random shots ceased, and the champions before named stood gallantly up to each other, resolving not to flinch from a trial of their respective strengths. A thousand guineas were bid by Earl Spencer, to which the Marquis added, ten. You might have heard a pin drop. All eyes were turned, all breathing well-nigh stopped. Every sword was put home within its scabbard, and not a piece of steel was seen to move or to glitter, save that which each of these champions brandished in his valorous hand. See, see, they parry, they lunge, they hit, yet their strength is undiminished, and no thought of yielding is entertained by either. Two thousand pounds are offered by the Marquis. Then it was that Earl Spencer, as a prudent general, began to think of an useless effusion of blood and expenditure of ammunition, seeing that his adversary was as resolute and fresh as at the onset. For a quarter of a minute he paused, when my Lord Althorpe advanced one step forward as if to supply his father with another spear for the purpose of renewing the contest. His countenance was marked by a fixed determination to gain the prize, if prudence in its most commanding form, and with a frown of unusual intensity of expression, had not bade him desist. The father and son, for a few seconds, converse apart, and the biddings are resumed. Two thousand two hundred and fifty pounds, said Lord Spencer. The spectators are now absolutely electrified. The Marquis quietly adds his usual ten, and there is an end of the contest. Mr. Evans, ere his hammer fell, made a due pause, and indeed, as if by something preternatural, the ebony instrument itself seemed to be charmed or suspended in mid-air. However, at length down, drop the hammer, and, as Lissardo has not merely poetically expressed himself, the echo of the sound of that fallen hammer was heard in the libraries of Rome, of Milan, and St. Mark. The name Dibdin has come to be almost synonymous with bibliomaniac. Although Pennypacker, twenty-five years ago, said that the true bibliomaniac was a rarissimo, nearly as scarce as the dodo, a new generation of Dibdin men is springing up. There are young men today who find it as difficult to pass an old bookstore or a junk shop as did those in years gone by, young fellows who will travel miles to enrich their knowledge of books. I'm afraid it's the old-timer, though, who lives among his books, sleeps among them, surrounded by folios, quartos, books of every size, who thrives in an atmosphere that is musty, who frowns upon cleanliness as a vice. Of course, such peculiarities are hardly necessary or desirable, but such men have lived. The modern Dibdin takes a course in bibliography at college and attends all book sales. He marks down prices, learns the various methods experienced bidders use, thus supplementing his college training with all that he learns in the auction room. Many years ago I knew a young married man who lived in Orange. He was auction mad. 
one New York sale we both attended continued for twelve evenings. On the twelfth, his bride appeared with him, and he introduced her to the other maniacs. In those days, it was quite unusual for a woman to appear at a book auction. Why did you bring Mrs. Blank tonight? I inquired. Oh, said he, it came to the point where I just had to prove there were such things as book auctions. Although the following tale has nothing to do with book auctions, I am reminded of it because it has distinctly to do with wives. And wives, there is no doubt about it, have their niche in the book world, if only for the influence they have upon their book-mad consorts. A small man with a shy, walrus-like look came to see me one day in Philadelphia. His meek appearance was in marked contrast to the determined manner with which he greeted me. He introduced himself as a piano tuner from Harrisburg. I have here, doctor, he said, pulling out of an inner pocket a blue envelope. Something which will interest you. I found it in a second-hand furniture store among a bundle of papers on its way to the pulp mill. I rescued it. He opened the envelope and drew out a pamphlet in brown paper wrappers. It was Poe's Prose Romances. No, I, containing the murders in the Rue Morgue, published in Philadelphia in 1843. There are only three or four copies known to exist. What do you want for it? I asked him. 3,800, he said quite calmly. Naturally, I was surprised that a man who made his living tinkering with refractory pianos should know the value of this work. In answer to further questions, he told me that he spent all his evenings and some of his days browsing in second-hand stores in the hope of making a book find. And now my dreams come true. I'm always picking up old books. It makes my wife wild. She always nags me. Wasting time and throwing away good cash, she calls it. Christopher Morley. I had to have this book. While I wrote out the check, I asked him why he wanted this peculiar sum and what he would do with it. He answered without hesitation. The first thing I'll do, he said, is to hand over eight hundred dollars of it to the missus and let her go to Europe, like she's always wanted to do. I told her I'd fix her one day. I guess she won't nag me any more. I recall the crowd present at the sale of the collection of that great editor of Keats, J. Buxton Foreman, in 1920. Students, collectors, poets, seers, bookmen were there. Suddenly, the auctioneer announced that the next item was a love letter of Keats to Fanny Braun, whereupon my friend Kit Morley was inspired and wrote this exquisite sonnet, which he dedicated to me. In an auction room, letter of John Keats to Fanny Braun, Anderson Galleries, March 15th, 1920. To Dr. A.S.W. Rosenbach. How about this lot, said the auctioneer. One hundred, may I say, just for a start. Between the plum-red curtains, drawn apart, a written sheet was held, and strange to hear. Dealer, would I were steadfast as thou art, the cold, quick bids against you in the rear. The crimson salon, in a glow more clear, burned blood like purple as the poet's heart, song that outgrew the singer, bitter love. That broke the proud hot heart it held in thrall, poor script, where still those tragic passions move. Eight hundred bid, fair warning, the last call, the soul of Adonai, like a star, sold for eight hundred dollars, Dr. R., penned by Christopher Morley.